You've discovered the Questions and Course Corrections podcast, sponsored by Compass Coaching Limited. And I'm your host and the coach, Mary Holmstrom. My passion is to serve as a life transitions organizational strategist and coach, working with women of faith as they travel through their process. I'm also a podcaster, as you can hear. What? A motivational speaker, an artist, a linguist, and a born world traveler. I created this podcast because I love collecting interesting conversations and ideas that mean to give pause to some of life's tough questions and maybe inspire you to do a deeper dive into a conversation of your own and possibly even discover a personal course correction. If you've stumbled into this conversation and you're thinking, hey, I do need a coach because I'm looking to address the course corrections of my own life, toggle on over to my web pages, compasscoaching.com. That's C O M P A S S. K-O-A-C-H-I-N-G dot com. Why the K, you ask? Well, the domain with a C was about $10,000, and so I thought it might be prudent to mix it up and save the money for more important things like a microphone that I'm using right now in this podcast. But enough of that. So, let's get into it. Hey, everyone. If you're listening to today's podcast, because of its sensitive content, make sure that you're in a space that's conscientious about little ears in the room. We'll be discussing sexual assault, which is a topic that's gained a lot of traction and airtime for various reasons, notably the Me Too movement that's awakened our culture in many ways. But this conversation today is not only important and essential, but it's personal. And I'm glad that you're here. So let's dive in. To clarify, sexual assault is illegal and or unwanted force upon a person without consent or is inflicted upon a person who's incapable of giving consent due to age or physical or mental incapacity or who places the assailant like a doctor in a position of trust or authority. Every 68 seconds, someone in America is sexually assaulted. Every nine minutes, that victim is a child. Evidence from Child Protective Services Agency has substantiated or found irrefutable evidence to indicate that 63,000 children are victims of sexual abuse on a yearly basis. A majority of those child victims are 12 to 17 years old. 34% of victims of sexual assault or rape are under 12 years old. 66% of these victims of sexual assault or rape are between 12 and 17 years old. Only 25 out of every 1,000 perpetrators will actually go to prison for this crime. And speaking of inmates, statistics tell us that nearly 81,000 prison inmates are sexually assaulted every year. Every year on average, there are around 434,000 people in this country who are 12 or older that are sexually assaulted or raped. One out of every six American women have been a victim of attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. About 3% of American men or one in 33 have experienced an attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. Nine out of every 10 victims of rape are female. The majority of assaults occur at home or near a victim's home. I mean, I could go on and on, right? The statistics around this evil epidemic in this country are shocking and upsetting and too numerous to keep noting. So, but they're readily available on rain.org in case you want to research this directly or check my resources. The stats aren't hard to find. And in the very least, I'm grateful that there are organizations like this doing the sobering work of accountability so that we can tap into our own personal rage and seek justice for the victims and survivors of sexual assault. Today, my guest to discuss this tough topic is Jill Monaco. Jill is one of these people filled with personal rage and on the forefront seeking justice, sharing her own story, and serving others through her work as an advocate and survivor. Jill is the founder and CEO of Jill Monaco Ministries, her nonprofit, her passion work to encourage people to pursue the presence of God and find freedom in Christ. She is, among many things, a speaker, a podcaster, an author, and a survivor of sexual assault. She's also created her own brand of freedom coaching, a model that blends hearing God using prayer and coaching tools. And her first book, The Freedom Coach Model, went to number one on the Amazon bestseller list. She is the board of reference and a master coach with the International Christian Coach Institution and holds a professional coaching certification with the International Coach Federation. She is a dedicated Bible teacher and speaker and known for captivating audiences on tough topics with her energy and humorous approach to life's serious issues. She also has a career that spans 20 years as a professional stage and commercial actor and voiceover talent, notably singing back up on the Perry Como's holiday tour performed in theaters across the country, which my mother, if she ever gets a hold of you, is going to talk your ear off about that. She's a huge fan of Perry Como. Uh, she is also a talented Disney kids audiobook actor. All these talents 
are currently nestled in Chicago, although her reach goes far beyond those borders. Jill, it's so good to have you on the Questions and Course Corrections podcast today. Thank you for letting me be on here. Yeah. You've mentioned that having been a victim of childhood abuse, broken relationships, and personal failures, in the past, you found yourself stuck in a cycle of shame and fear and rejection. But through your pursuit of freedom from that bondage, it led to a number of course corrections. And I'm really grateful that you're just taking the time to talk about this issue of sexual assault today, to share a bit about your own story and hopefully impact that one person who was meant to hear this episode. I'm truly honored. This is a tough topic. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it is a it is a tough topic for people to hear. And also the reason it's tough for some people to hear is because they don't want to believe it could be that bad. And for other people, it's hard to hear because they went through it and it triggers them of their own experience. So yeah, it's a tough topic. Yeah. So why don't we just start from the beginning, if that's okay with you, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about your own personal story. Yeah, thanks for asking. I think it's it's really important to know that stories like you know, I'm going to give the it's kind of like an elevator pitch. It's a it's an overview of of a story and there's so many nuances that we don't have time to go into and so if I sound very matter of fact, it's it's often described in a book called The Body Keeps the Score is that we have a cover story that victims or survivors are able to tell the cover story without a lot of emotion and that can make people wonder like did that really happen are you telling the truth um mm -hmm. you know well it doesn't seem to have affected you you seem to be okay you bounced back and so uh, part of my story is the, what happened to me and then what the other part of my story is what was going on internally inside of me and so what i showed to the world was not always what was going on inside and that's really common i mean just for anybody not even sexual assault but I really attribute, and I want this to be just, it's so important for me to, to let people know that I attribute how I've gotten through this and how I have healed to the grace of God, because I know my story would be different if it weren't for his intervention. So I just want to preface my story with that. So I was raised in the Catholic church and um, went to CCD and, you know, knew about Jesus, didn't know Jesus. And when I was really young, I started going to a, a different church for a youth group and my girlfriend had invited me and I really started hearing about Jesus and was like, I just, I'm really curious. And I started memorizing scripture and I just, I, I look at that season and I am so grateful because a year later, um, it was the summer between seventh and eighth grade, um, I was in the youth group at the Catholic Church. And at that time, there was a priest who was a young, he was a young seminarian, but we called him Father Mark. He wore the collar. He was a priest. I mean, a 12-year-old, 13-year-old doesn't know the difference between ordained or not. We don't really understand any of that. But the entire congregation was led to believe that he was a father. And um, I didn't even really know he was in seminary till later. And so Father Mark was in charge of the youth group, and he would take us places. He would drive us around um, and to different events and youth events and things like there drive me home. And so one particular night, he drove all of us kids home and I was the last one in the car and I was in the front seat. And he leaned over into the passenger side to hug me. And then he did more than that. And I don't usually give a lot of the details just because it can be, you know, triggering for some people. And so I was, I had never been kissed by a boy. You know, I liked someone at school. You know, I just gotten out of seventh grade and I look back at those pictures or my nieces at that age and go, oh my goodness, we're just babies. <sighs> and so I was very shocked. And I remember going into the house and I was angry. And I think that's important for, you know, even adult victims to realize anger is a normal first reaction to a violation to your body. But I didn't know what to do with that. And over time, um, that entire summer, he had access to me. And so it happened on more than one occasion. And I was consistently being violated. And one of the, there's a couple different responses that we now know psychologically that you do to survive. One is you fight back. And I grew up in a very disciplinary family. And so speaking up to an adult was, you know, not okay. And so even though my parents would never want me to be abused, I couldn't tell in my child mind, it was okay to say no. It was okay to say, stop that or tell an adult. I didn't fight back and I didn't run away because of 
you know, oftentimes a man's size and power and authority. And you mentioned earlier, it's not just um, the act and the the physical aspect, but it's also an abuse when it's their position of authority over yeah, it's you. Yeah, that power. Yeah. And the other two responses are fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And freeze is when you do nothing and you just let it happen and you sometimes disassociate. You're literally not there. And there are chunks of my memory that I don't have. And so, you know, therapists have told me most likely you were frozen and your body does that so that you don't remember the horror of what happened. And the other is fawn, which is if someone's yelling at you, you just try, you, you know, are nice to them and you tell them you're sorry and things like that. And so all of those things happened at some point during the summer. The last time I was I was being abused, I I stood up to him. And so that was the fight that I did. And that actually is what ended it. It's There's many aspects to that. So the abuse happened all summer long. And I remember feeling embarrassed. I was scared if anyone found out. And some of the things they tell you are you can't tell anyone or else this will happen to you or it will happen to me. And it becomes very messed up as far as you don't even know what to think about this. And so then he, at the very last time, like I said, we were driving and he was I actually said to him, you, you like women, you shouldn't be a priest. And he got mad at me and tossed me out of the car and I walked home. And so that was my little bit of a fight back because I was wow. like, fine. And then in eighth grade, he came into my classroom and walked all the way. I was sitting in the back and he walked all the way to the back of the classroom in front of my friends and started massaging my shoulders. And I was so mad and embarrassed. So now I'm being abused in front of people. And so we need to be, you know, sidebar, we need to be paying attention. I think today is a very different day than it was back when I was a child. But we need to be paying attention to these inappropriate touches that a child does not like. It is not appropriate to be that friendly with a child that is not, you know, well, it even in family can be inappropriate. We just have to be as adults be paying attention to how a child responds to things. And then after that, I walked to my locker and he was trying to talk to me and wanted to see me. And I was yelling at him. And I remember the kids saying, why are you yelling at Father Mark? And so I fought back then with that saying no. Then at youth group on Sunday night, he followed me there and tried to see me. And I was again telling him to leave me alone. And a father, one of the fathers of one of the other kids stepped in and said, "You, Jill does not want to talk to you. You need to leave. It's almost like he saw you as a challenge at that point. It was he had you marked and he, which I think speaks to his predatory nature. Yeah. Yeah. And you know there's there's so many other pieces to the story that he continued in my 20s to pursue me and called my house. And so that's what happened. And but there were other sexual assault things that happened throughout my life. And so what I didn't know at the time was that as you get older, you have whatever fires together wires together. And so what fired together was this piece of sexuality and inappropriateness and that fired together. So it was wired in my brain. So I dated men who looked like him. I ended up, you know, letting men do with my body what they wanted to. I didn't know how to say no. And I'd go back to my dorm room or back to my house and be so mad at myself. So it turned from anger on a perpetrator to anger on me. But there are other incidents where they didn't know. They thought, well, I pushed the I pushed it this far and she let me. And so this can become a pattern for women who have been abused as a child. I used to call it my broken no. I just don't know how to say no. And I don't know why I, I don't know why I freeze and do nothing. And it's so frustrating. And it's the way our brain is wired to protect us and keep us safe because that's the number one goal of the brain. And so that led to, my therapist said it this way, there are times that other women will see warning signs, but you don't. You don't see the warning signs because your brain's not wired to see them. It's too scary to think, well, that man being nice to me could be flirtation, which could lead to a bad place. So that also led to now I'm in ministry, right? And there's a huge chunk of time in my life I'm skipping over. But the other highlight was I was in ministry as a worship leader and the senior pastor who was married hit on me. And he told me how he wanted a relationship with me. And I had to turn him into the elders and he admitted it, but I had to go through that trauma all over again. And that is the first, when that happened, I, that was the first time I told anyone about the priest. 
Mm-hmm. And I uh, I told my parents, I said, this has happened to me before because it was religious again, right? So it really triggered it. And so there's been other incidents in my adult life where I have stood up now. And as I've gotten more healing, I've learned to stand up in the moment or tell authorities. But every single time it takes an enormous amount of energy for me to do it. But I've almost joked, why is the enemy like even bother? Don't bother with me. You know, I will turn them in. (laughs) But it's very, very difficult. And so now I uh, the other end of my story is like, really, it's what God has done. He got me through. That's why I mentioned that I I was starting to learn who Jesus was. And I learned scripture because I never forgot who Jesus was in the midst of a man who's supposed to represent Jesus, do it wrong. So that throughout my, my life, I knew God was real and I knew he loved me. That was in my subconscious, but I never would have gone into ministry in my mind. Like God set me up to always want to love him and serve him. So my healing journey, what I call my freedom journey, getting free from shame, getting free from depression, anxiety, all of those things, as God taught me, as he gave me tools in my quiet time with him, I started doing with other people before I was a coach. And then I started incorporating into freedom coaching with my coaching business. And I help people get through the hard stuff and learn who God truly is learn who they are in Christ, and then learn to help others or walk in the freedom and be who God created them to be. Because our story is not our destiny. I love that. Our story is not our destiny. Thank you, first of all, for just being so vulnerable and sharing that story. I know that I, I think it's interesting too what you said in the beginning. I don't really like to get into the details because it may be triggering for someone else. Mm. The other thing that struck me was dispelling this argument that a lot of people say, why didn't you just tell someone? Why didn't you just scream? How do we begin to help people get on the other side of that guilt and shame wall that we need to push through to help them, to get them what they need, the resources, just to begin the kernel of starting down that path? Yeah, I think it's different for everyone. I mean, I tried to report him several times. I had called SNAP, which is an organization that helps survivors of abuse from priests. And um, I got so much anxiety. I tried to re- do several different times. I tried to report or find out what to do. And in some cases, I asked people, as once I admitted it to my parents, I asked the new church I was at, and they didn't want me to do that because what it would bring a big scandal upon the church. It would bring attention to, you know, something negative. And so it's, you have to be careful who you tell. And it may not be family and the closest friends or your church that you need to tell, especially if the abuse happened in the church. I had an okay church experience because I told the elders and they believed me, right? And he admitted it. In both cases, the priesthood has admitted it, by the way, to the police when I did report him. So you have to find someone that'll help. And so my first piece of advice is if this has happened to you, go to a counselor who and a therapist, you know, if you can find a trauma specialist, but find someone who's educated in this because they will be able to walk you through the steps because your nervous system will maybe go berserk and you're just feeling scared or anxious or whatever. And they're there to walk you through the repercussions of you using your voice for the first time. Because sometimes it's also the perpetrator is a family member or you don't want to mess up the family, but it couldn't hurt you to find someone who's safe to talk to. So that's that would be my first, you know, my first right. thought. That's kind of a, I don't know. I mean, my first question would be, you know, depending upon people, they're in their own set of circumstances. Sometimes they don't have the resources or they even know. So Uh hopefully they'll listen to something like this and then kind of, you know, hear your advice, but just find, I mean, how do I find the right person kind of thing? One of the first things I found was a nonprofit that does it counseling for free that handles this specifically. And I'm in the Chicagoland area right now. So I found, I don't even remember how I found them, but there's different organizations that will help you and will give you counseling for free when you've gone through assault or abuse. And uh, they're life-saving for those that don't have the money. Because the other thing that happens is when you've been a victim of your body, you also see the world through nothing's going to work out for me. You're a victim in everything. Everything that happens, it's either that person's fault or your fault because you're bad. That's what shame says. It's not that I did something bad. It's that I am bad. Or you're projecting your stuff and saying, well, it's I don't have success because of that person. So it goes both ways. You're really hard on others and you're really hard on yourself. And so that's something to pay attention to as people that have been victims to know this is it's called a victim mindset. Right. And that can be a bent that we really have to work through. So if someone is listening and they've been a victim and they feel strong enough 
I'd say go to the police and file a report. And it's you should do it in the city it happened in. So if you've moved across country, that's why I say a counselor is probably my first thing. Right. But I went to the police and reported it. But what I did before that was I saw something on the news that the Illinois Attorney General's office was doing an investigation about priests. And so my story looks a little different, but I saw that and I thought, well, they'll believe me. And I called them and then they held my hand and said, OK, now go file a police report. And then the police said, OK, now we're going to give you a detective. Come back in and talk to us. And then, they, you know, they, it led one thing to another. And so I was kind of passed off on helpers. I didn't have a counselor at the time. But I know that not everyone can go to report to the police. I couldn't at first. It was too hard. Right. I want to talk a little bit about the church versus your relationship with Jesus. But you made me think of something, you know, how our American culture and lies around she was asking for it. It. it kind of pointing to that self shame and guilt, you know, when you're saying, you know, well, what, it, what were you doing that made them do this horrible thing? Even women who are in positions of whether it's prostitution or to be in these vulnerable sorts of things where that gives no one carte blanche the right to sexually assault that person, regardless of the situation. Do you see what I mean? It's yeah. like, if you're in that position, then they have the right to treat you horribly. But even, you know, you as a seventh grader and walking around saying, well, what did I do to make him do that? Am I wearing clothes a certain way or whatever a child's mind might think? What was I doing? Yeah, I think that's a, a very normal thing. I didn't think about in seventh grade, like, what would what did I do? And I think that's beautiful innocence because I couldn't have been sexy, <laughs> you know, right. like I was wearing, you know, the white collared shirt buttoned up to my neck and a little plaid skirt like we do in parochial schools. I will say this to women, to anywhere from a child to an adult, it doesn't matter what you wear or how you act does not give a man permission to touch you without your permission, period. It doesn't matter. But it's normal for us as women to wonder, what did I do? I remember right. thinking that as a as a child, I remember thinking, what did I do? And I couldn't come up with anything, but I knew I wasn't too sexy. I know that as an adult. And then you wonder like, oh, I, I let him do it. Well, no, I didn't let him do it. I didn't have the ability at 12, 13 years old to say no. The, it, the way that the, the relationship was, he was an authority in my life. But as women, as adults, speaking to what you said about, do we wear something? Do they deserve it? Do they attract it? Do they want it? I think that's been something communicated over the decades by men. I don't have control of myself. Like when you dress like that, that is bl you know, blame shifting and placing the blame on a woman, but it's okay for a man to go out strutting his stuff, wearing a Speedo at the, ba you know, at the beach. And because we don't. That's super sexy. It's rural. Yeah. <laughs> I don't don't need to see it, guys. That, that, I don't know. That, yeah. Exactly. You've got some pretty high thoughts about yourself. But you bring there. up a really good point, though, that the it's almost like regardless of what you're wearing or how you're carrying yourself, the onus is always put on the woman. Yeah. The that we need to change to not tempt them. And you know what that's saying yeah. subconsciously is that men are weak. Men are not weak. Men and women are both incredibly different and strong and beautiful in their own ways. Right. I love that, that point. It's like saying yeah. you don't have any self-control. You're an animal. And that right. is not the case at it's all. That's why there's a distinction. I think it's really interesting how you're drawing a distinction between the religiosity or the sort of the, the process of going through the, the, the catechism. And, you know, it's like this this relationship with church versus a relationship with the Lord yeah. and how you knew that there was a distinction between the two of, and I think that a lot of people, especially caught up in what we know about sexual abuse in the church is that many people have fallen away from the church, whether it's the Catholic church or, you know, a non-denominational church or whatever it happens to be. People equate the church with God whereas the two are yeah. not synonymous. So can you just talk a little bit about that distinction? Yeah, I think even in the New Testament, Paul is pretty clear when he's talking to the church about like, and I'm going to paraphrase like entire books that say you're not acting like Jesus. You're not looking like Jesus. You're not taking care of people like Jesus. You're bickering amongst each other. You're fighting for position. You're, you know, engaging in acts you shouldn't engage in. And so I think the distinction needs to be for those of us that want to love God and want to love Jesus and want to have a faith to remember the church doesn't always look like Jesus because we're all in the process of sanctification. And so I don't, 
I don't put an expectation on the church, an evangelical church I go to now, any more than the Catholic church to look like Jesus yet, but we're all in the process of trying. And so for a survivor, I think the important piece is to say that behavior is not okay. That uh, that behavior is not okay because I know it's not okay, whether it's legally, right? Because there's something illegal happening or because of what scripture says, but also to know who God is. We only know who God is by going to the scriptures and learning who he is and through prayer and being in relationship with him. We can't identify what's wrong in the church or with a leader of the church, not to place accusation. I want to be careful about this, but we don't know what's wrong if we don't know what's right. So that's why we focus more on the light than we do on the dark, because the light will cast out darkness. I don't have to know everything about the dark, but when I know everything about the light, when the dark comes, I go, that's not God. Uh, that, that doesn't sound like God. That doesn't look like God. I know him. I'm in a relationship with him. I know his voice is tender and kind to me. And I know he won't violate my boundaries. He gave us free will. He will never violate my own will or boundaries. He will give me some consequences sometimes that, you know, he'll let me experience those consequences to gently guide me back or for some people harshly bring them back into alignment with who he is because that's good for us because he loves us so desperately. But we do have to separate the church from God. So, so because they're not the same. Yeah. Yeah. What do we say to somebody who says, why did God allow this? If there mm-hmm. is a distinction between church and God and God mm-hmm. is sovereign, God is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He sees this. He knows me better than I know myself. If we're going to believe that, mm-hmm. why did he let this happen to me? I think when someone says that to me, the first thing I say isn't to try and give them an answer because they're they're trying to logically explain their pain. And so I think it's really important to validate somebody's pain and say I'm sorry that happened to you. And I I what I do know is that God loves you and he's in his in the, your pain with you and he wants to heal you. We have to give people hope before logic. And how important is it to make the distinction between the clarification that there is God and that the enemy yeah. is, you know, here. Yeah. Yeah, I think we are as a society, we've been quick to place blame on God with what is meant to be placed on the enemy. God didn't do that to you. The enemy did. Did God allow it or did he protect you from worse and you just can't see the full picture and know what he protected you from? I know my childhood abuse was terrible. Could I say that God didn't protect me from that? Or can I say, wow, a lot worse could have happened and he did protect me, right? So man still has free will and the priest made some decisions, but but God was behind the scenes and God was with me in it. And I think there is some there are some questions, some mysteries that we will not understand until heaven. And if I try and solve that question of God, why weren't you there for me? That's the voice of the accuser trying to get me to accuse God of not being good. That question can place doubt in my mind for how the goodness and the love of God. And then he wins. And I will not let him win and place accusations against a powerful and omniscient, wonderful, good God. And so, again, I just choose to focus on who he is and who I am in him. And some of those questions will get answered in heaven, but here on earth, the enemy does not get any more space in my head. And where do we go when we're talking about justice here on earth? Is there justice in the end? Are you getting justice? Do we see a pattern of, of justice more so? And I want to ask you a little bit about the Me Too movement, what you think of that too, but that's justice in itself. People just talking about it, right? Yeah. It's really good for survivors to say, what is my expectation of justice? What does that look like? Because it's different for everyone. And justice may be a million dollars. Justice may be that he's taken out a position. I mean, it's we all have different expectations. But one thing I do know is that if we set expectations that this is only what justice looks like, we will most likely be let down every single time because there there really is no justice for what happened to you. Like it's nothing is ever going to be enough for what happened. It's not going to replace the years of your pain or the other things that happened to you because of that. Nothing is ever going to make up for it. And true justice, the justice of God, he redeems everything. And we have a lifetime to see the redemption here, but we also have redemption in heaven. And so I think we will see the true justice in heaven, but we have to be careful how we measure that here on earth and not to, again, accuse God or even man of not giving justice. I have not gotten everything I've wanted from dealing with this. I have, you know, been in, I I got a lawyer and I've been through the process with this priest. 
I miss the statute of limitations. And so the law, he would say the priest right now, he is free. He did get fired from his position, but he's free to get another job with children if he wants to. Do I think that's just in God's economy? No, absolutely not. He could hurt other children. However, that's what the law is here on earth. And so I have to just say, God, protect those that he's around and show me justice eventually. But my heart and my goal isn't to get justice. My goal is to be closer to Jesus and be more made in his image. So we have to be careful of what our end game is and really redefine that because we'll always be disappointed by man, but never by God. It's a great reminder what the enemy meant for harm, God has caused for good. Mm -hmm. But we might not always get to see what that yeah. is. We don't get to see what's behind yeah. the scenes sometimes either. True. True. Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, then what? How are you going to respond? And this is where my coachy stuff comes in. Right. How are you going to respond if you don't get the justice that you want? Is it to not set expe expectations? No, absolutely. Go for it. Tell the Lord what you want in this situation. But if it isn't met, already predetermine what your response to that is going to be. So my predetermined response was going to be praise the Lord anyway, no matter what happens with this case, which is not done, that I will praise the Lord anyway. And I'll be thankful that he, he brought me through a journey, right? The process of our character development and what God does in us is just as important as the, as the other stuff. Which really speaks to how we intentionally live moving forward, even after something as horrible as sexual assault, whatever we've gone through, how we are intentionally living in this moment mm -hmm. and not letting that get stolen. We're not giving an experience or whatever it happens to be the permission yeah. to dictate how we live the rest of our life. Like you said in the beginning, yeah. that is not my destiny. That yeah. doesn't define my destiny. And no one wants to be defined or guided by bitterness or anger. It's just a horrible place to live. And that just gives the event that happened power over you for the rest of your life. And so I know there are people that are listening to this that are suffering because they've gone through much worse than me. And they're thinking, Jill, you don't know what I went through. Mm -hmm. And I have heard horrific stories that I would think are worse than mine. Right. But what it does to the psyche often is similar. And so we get to choose and we can choose. We are powerful people. God gave us a brilliant mind. We have the mind of Christ and his anointing and his favor and his love can truly shift and heal anything you've gone through. And that may mean you become an advocate or that may mean that you found, you know, peace you know, in the midst of your pain, whatever it looks like. But we have to remember that if we can enter into forgiveness, it's not letting the perpetrator get away scot-free. It means that we get away scot-free. We are not tied to that pain anymore when we forgive and move forward without the bitterness. It heals our hearts and brings us all those beautiful things in our life that we do want. Right. I love that because it is a great reminder that forgiveness isn't for necessarily the perpetrator. It is for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is really good. How do we get to that point of reconciliation? And I want to just preface this by saying, I want to validate anyone who's at whatever part of their journey that they're at with this. I know that you have gone through a lot of work yeah. uh, intentionally. Maybe somebody's in that place where they're just not there yet. Yeah. And maybe they're in that anger stage or whatever it happens to be. So I yeah. want to validate those feelings for those who, who are in that place right now. But how did you get to the point where you could forgive? I don't know if reconciliation necessarily with this priest is the right word, but maybe to reconcile yourself to the situation and, and go through that forgiveness process. Yeah. I think that's such a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because there are people that are sitting here listening that are angry. And they're like, I can't even forgive yet. And I, when I started counseling, I, I had a problem being angry, like just with anything in my life, any injustice, any harm done to me from any different thing. I didn't want to be angry because it, I felt like it was sin and it was wrong. And I, you forget the verse, be angry and do not sin. So anger is an emotion that is not too scary for God. In the Bible, God was angry. It's that if we take that, you know, in my Christian faith, we, you know, take it to the Lord. But there are people probably listening to this that don't have faith. So I want to address that. It is okay to be angry. It's okay to be angry. It's what you do in response to that anger. Let that anger fuel you to get to healing. It is okay to say it was wrong that I was violated. In fact, someone else validating your anger and saying, I'm angry that you were violated. That was wrong that that happened to you. 
what a victim can do is go, oh gosh, I don't want you to be angry. So I'm going to share my story in a different way now. So you're not angry because anger is bad because I don't like the anger. So I don't want you to be angry. So if you are the person who's angry, no, it's okay. If you are someone who's angry on behalf of someone else, I would just suggest take out that word. I'm angry on your behalf. It may feel like you're validating them, but just say, I am so sorry that happened to you. That was wrong. So that as the survivor, I don't have to now make sure you're okay on top of me being okay. So there's that process of anger that has to be worked through for sure. But then at your question and moving into like the next phases, there's also um, the cycles of grief would be similar. You know, then there's the denial. Everything's fine. I'm making too big of a deal of this. If I keep making a big deal, I am way too much for my family. But then you constantly feel like you're not enough at the same time because you can't show up like you want to because you've got this internal dialogue going on. Mm -hmm. But it's normal to go through these phases of grief. I think um, there's it, also something to be said for not saying anything or not. I don't know. It's like uh, now I'm going to be the girl who was sexually assaulted. Like that's how people identify me. Oh, yeah. That's how I'm judged now. And every room I walk in when I share this, if I share this with my family and being brave enough to say this does not define me. Yeah. When I first reported it and the police had gone to him and he had admitted it that night, I got a phone call that he had admitted it. And then I had a big function after that. And I went and my aunt said to me, oh, great. Can we stop talking about this now? Oh, wow. And I was like, ouch. Like, so I've never talked to her about it, but obviously the family had been talking about it. And so right. it's uncomfortable for family members to have to hear about it. And so there's other elements of things that you, are, it's just the beginning when you start reporting it. Which but it just, sounds like can be surprising landmines when you start being vulnerable yeah. and opening up yeah, and other people taking things also out of context and not really truly understanding your story, especially if they have never experienced sexual harassment, sexual assault. Some people don't want to hear your story, but it, if, it's at, if that's your story at the time, it's okay. That's where you're at at that time. Because if you stuff it, it doesn't mean it went away. It just means it's really inside of you and it'll come out in an inappropriate way later. So you have to do what's best for you in telling your story, which means finding those people that are safe to process your story with. Because not everyone can handle it and it should not reflect on you whether they respond well or not. Thank you for saying that. I think that is so important to validate. If this is your story right now, that's okay. Because that's what's going on in your mind. You're going through process. You're trying to process everything that's happened to you. Yeah. And that can take time and it's different for everybody. And it doesn't, I, I think that's also valid. What happens to one person can be worse for another person. All of our stories are unique, but how it affects our psyche, how we process that is as individual as the sexual assault Absolutely. perpetration itself. And so oh, I, just, I just feel so uh, burdened by making sure that people feel validated in that. What do you think of the Me Too movement? Do you think that that's helped us? Do you think that anything has changed or is it just really great fodder for entertainment mags, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah, I remember when it was first coming out in Hollywood and and I I literally it was just a prophetic word I think that came out of my mouth and I said, "Well, the church is next." And I remember my mom looked at me like, "What?" And I just had an inner knowing that it was something God was doing that he was I believe God doesn't let things come out right away because he loves that person too and he gives people lots of chances to repent. And so I had a sense that there was going to be a big movement within the church. And sure enough, now we're seeing senior pastors, the Southern Baptist Convention, like lots of abuse coming out with pastors all over the country that have been abusing women, but also abusing the church in other ways with money and things like that. And so I think the Me Too movement, if we even open our eyes, what it's doing in our society beyond the sexual assault, did it, it started what we heard in Hollywood and then the church with women being sexually assaulted, but there's also men who have been assaulted. And so then we saw that in Hollywood starting to come out, but there've been people talking about this, but it didn't get the headlines. And so it's been frustrating for people that have been trying to bring light to this, because when you're confronting a powerful person, you're taking a chance of being discredited because your voice is maybe not as credible. Victims are sometimes messed up, <laughs> like they're drinking, they're doing drugs, they deserved it, they're a mess. Why they're should we believe that? 
Yeah. Yeah. Why should we believe them? So I do think the Me Too movement has been good, but like anything new, it's always messy. Yeah. And so I think it's uncomfortable for a lot of people who had no idea this was going on. And it's almost like a movie, right? I'm fascinated by it, but I do not make me sit and watch that movie for seven years straight. I do not want to keep watching the movie. I can't handle it, right? We're used to going in for two hours, watching a movie that's terrible and has a happy ending and walking away. This happy ending you know, of the story may take a really long time, but I do believe God is doing great things in the Me Too movement. I think the caution I would have is that we have to be discerning because not every comment that somebody makes, man or woman, is an assault, right? So there are times when you're being playful or joking with someone, but if you are a woman and someone says something to you and it feels off, it probably is. If you're a man and a woman says something to you or a man and it feels off, it probably is. That's a warning sign that a lot of victims or just people in general, we give people the benefit of the doubt. And I think in the beginning of the Me Too movement, we have to pay attention to what is the Holy Spirit letting us know. Something doesn't feel right here. I don't want to judge that person. I'm not going to turn them in, but something doesn't feel right here. So I'm going to set a boundary before anything happens. And I think that's important in the midst of this Me Too movement to not jump on the bandwagon to say, oh my gosh, this terrible thing happened to me too. When it may not have been. So that may sound funny to people for someone who's just been assaulted like me. I should be a champion of the Me Too movement. But I'm saying let's not run the pendulum to the other side that discredits the real victims of things that have happened. You know, something has happened to them. I think that it's important to remember just kind of going springboarding off what you said is that we are given the tools, the internal tools to know when something's off. We kind of, we know, we -hmm. know. And I, I love that you said when something somebody says something, does something, and it feels uncomfortable, there's a reason why it feels uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And there's a testing that goes on, I think, because a lot of us who are coming from, whether it's that innocence point of view, depending upon youth, or just depending upon exposure in general, it's like, did that really... Am I wrong to think that that happened? You know, what's, what is off about that? How do I judge that or clarify that for myself? I also think that it was so important what you said about the perpetrator and God's grace and mercy. We think of, I guess, the Old Testament as sort of a God of fury and anger and restitution and, you know, the law. And then we get to the New Testament and the new covenant and Jesus is all forgiving and it's all, you know, it's a complete other shift of, of mindset, right? But I think that it is really important to remember it's also not just overnight, right? The mm-hmm. enemy is out there. But it's like he it's not it's kind of like the frog in the water, right? It's not overnight necessarily. I suppose there are right. exceptions to the rule, but right. the perpetrator, what were they perpetrated upon? Right. Or what kind of a victim are they in their own lives? Is this yeah. you know, this is something that happens. It's like drips in a pail. Obviously, sometimes people get more confident the mm-hmm. further they go because they're testing the boundaries too. But yeah. it's I, I think that's just a really good point that the Lord died for them too. And, and he yeah. does give a lot of grace. Yeah. I do want to say one thing about the, not every touch on the finger, you know, could be something. Um, but a lot of times predators are testing the waters and they're pushing it. So yeah, that's why boundaries. It, yeah. So if it feels off to you, it probably is because they're testing the boundary of what's going on. There's some great science, I couldn't exactly direct you to it, that the heart communicates what it's feeling and thinking up to like 15 feet away or something like that. I could totally be getting that wrong, but it, the heart communicates, there's as many neurons in our heart and in our gut as our head. There's There are different numbers, but there's a lot of uh, our instincts that we sometimes toss aside because we want to be a logical mm-hmm. community. But if your gut says something's off, it probably is, is because they're also pushing the boundaries. Where is your struggle now? Does the victim ever forget? We can forgive, but like, does it ever go away? Are we ever healed? Is there a full healing that can happen? That's a good question. Because I'm still kind of in the process of having to retell my story a lot, I'm not forgetting details. I don't think I ever will. But where I'm at right now is I'm in a really good place. I can talk about this subject or talk about the priest without any anger or bitterness or wishing anything ill. I never did wish anything ill upon him, but I just, I don't have... I don't have any emotions behind it anymore. And I don't know if it's because I've told it a lot or like I mentioned earlier in the podcast that the body keeps the score says we have a cover story. So 
I present, I've been told I present really well and I can communicate this really well, but it doesn't mean that there are times when I'm having behind the scenes, having to deal with attorneys or something else that I fall apart and cry and I'm a mess. Right. And so what I've learned is it's okay to be both. Do you know two opposite things can be equally true at the same time? I can be a mess behind the scenes and crying and then come on a podcast and talk about it and be okay. But I'm never sure what's going to happen afterwards. So, you know, after this podcast, I scheduled some time to just be and not have another meeting right away because I don't know what's going to come up. But if something does, that's the Lord trying to heal it. And so making space, I think, is a very important key that I get people make space for when you tell your story, you're talking about it to process how you're feeling. Have your expectations been met for justice? I think I had different expectations. That's why I gave that advice to hold them loosely, because no, I don't think my expectations have been met in many ways. In the face of the law, him being able to get away with doing whatever because of statute limitations, I have to accept that um, because it is what it is. But I did expect, maybe I'm just innocent to me, I expected the church to do more and care more than they have. But again, Um, I think that draws the line between the expectations of the church and the expectations of God. Again, we're back to sort of looking at those two things very, very differently and what that means for us each personally. Yeah. So there's different kinds, there's different buckets of expectation, right? So, and that's why it's complicated. And so maybe today something happened and I don't, my expectation wasn't met. And then next week I'm like, oh, I saw how God used that for good and has made it more beautiful. And so I hold that loosely. So where I'm at today, as far as my expectations been met, I, I do think there's a lot more work to be done. I don't think how it was handled with me, it was as good as it could have been handled, but I do think they did the best they could with the knowledge they have today. Are you still angry at your perpetrator, at yourself? Do you still beat yourself up? I am not angry at the perpetrator. I think there have been regrets that I've had, even in how I handled this, you know, like when I reported, my regret would be I didn't report him early enough, right? So I sometimes beat myself up for that. And I think how many other children or women are going to be hurt because I didn't have the guts to do it sooner. So that's an area where, Mm. you know, and could that be anger at myself? Yeah, maybe it could be. Maybe I need to to spend more time with the Lord on that. So I think that also, I think ah, that's such an important point, but it also speaks to the part of process that you were in at each juncture, right? Each phase of where you're at. So if you didn't, and this is again, for anyone who's listening to this, who feels the same regret, you could be 99 years old and be like, why didn't I say something sooner? But you were at the phase that you were at because that's where you were. Yeah. And there's no blame in that. There's no blame shifting. You handled things as you could, as you could take them and process them and begin to reconcile that for yourself right where you are. And so that's fair, man. That's yeah, fair. That's, you said that so well. We just have to choose to love ourselves in the phase that we're in and just know we're doing the best we can. Nobody chooses to do it the worst. I mean, in the healing right. process, there's there's no textbook on how to do this. So, and it may come up again. You may feel like, oh, I'm not angry at the perpetrator or angry at myself today, but next week you are. So, right. If there was one thing that you could say to somebody who's either experienced sexual assault in the past And it's maybe even a long distance memory or somebody who's living with sexual assault on a day-to-day basis. What would you tell them if you had them sitting in front of you right now? Oh gosh, if they're sitting in front of me, I would just tell them, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm just so sorry. Just how can I serve you? Just, I would just let them talk. Honestly, I probably wouldn't say much. They've been silenced enough. I would let them talk and just tell them I'm sorry and be empathetic and compassionate. Yeah, I love that. Jill, it's been great having you here today to discuss this really difficult topic. Thanks for having me. Folks, if you'd like to learn more about Jill and her journey and the work that she's doing or check out any of her materials, many of them are free resources. You can find her at jillmonicoministries.com or email her directly at jillmonicoministries at gmail.com. And until next time, keep pursuing your true north.